The following day, the Battle of Talavera was won. A grateful government rewarded Wellesley by creating him Viscount Wellington. He concluded a letter by saying, this is the first time I've signed my new name. But the new Viscount Wellington didn't push on towards Madrid. Instead, facing superior French forces and short of supplies, he retreated to Portugal. He now entered his most difficult period in the whole war. Wellington knew that he couldn't launch another attack into Spain. His army was simply too weak. For nearly 14 months, through the winter break and the entire campaigning season that followed, his troops did little except watch and wait on the border. On the other side, the French built up their forces, preparing for a mass invasion of Portugal. During the long pause, Wellington was in fact hatching a plan. And in the autumn of 1810, this would astonish the world. But frightened of leaks, and almost obsessively determined to do everything for himself, Wellington played things very close to his chest. This alienated some officers. They didn't understand why they were doing nothing and began to doubt Wellington's judgment. When problems arose, they complained behind his back. Wellington called them croakers. As soon as an accident happens, every man who can write and has a friend who can read sits down to write an account of what he does not know. These pessimistic reports found their way into the newspapers at home undermined public confidence and damaged the army's morale. This infuriated Wellington. Though he'd always strained under authority himself, he expected his officers to follow him unquestioningly. He felt under no obligation to explain himself. His only aim was to beat the French. The French army preparing to invade Portugal was commanded by Marshal André Massena. Massena had won many battles and had a towering reputation. But Wellington dubbed him the spoilt child of victory, and resolved to teach the marshal something about defeat. In August 1810, Massena's army marched into Portugal. Wellington and his allied army began to retreat to Lisbon. Wellington's officers despaired at following 14 months of inactivity with retreat. The opposition in England panicked. Massena looked forward to driving the British into the sea. Only Wellington knew what really lay in store. On the 14th of October, Massena's army came to an abrupt halt. Under Wellington's instructions, Portuguese workers had built a network of defences which transformed 500 square miles around Lisbon into an impregnable fortress. Stunned, Massena refused to attack. The fortifications became known as the Lions of Torres Vedras. The Lions of Torres Vedras consisted of 152 forts, many of them like this, and miles of temporary defences. They were built to defend a segment of Portugal lying between the coast and the River Tagus. There were three lines, each arcing closer to the vital city and harbour of Lisbon. The lines weren't held by Wellington's field army, but by Portuguese militia and British marines. This left the army free to concentrate to meet an attack wherever it came. Outside the lines, Wellington had decreed a scorched earth policy. All the crops were burnt, and 200,000 Portuguese peasants and their livestock were brought inside. Wellington was confident that the French couldn't break through, and they'd have nothing to live on outside. They could either fight and lose, or starve. It is remarkable that the French had heard nothing about the construction of the lines. Wellington's own self-restraint in not publicising his ambitious project had paid off. And crucially, his plan had won the confidence and support 
of the thousands of Portuguese who had built the fortifications and those who'd agreed to burn and leave their land. Even with all this activity, there'd been no leaks. It's as if Hadrian's Wall had been constructed in secrecy. Wellington was based here, in this house near the town of Torres Vedras. As he waited for the French to retreat, one of his tasks was to be certain that his troops were properly equipped when they went on the offensive again. Amongst other things, he had to ensure that every infantryman had a working musket. Remarkably, this has been here in Portugal since the Peninsula War. It's the British infantryman's most important possession, the India pattern brown bess musket. To load it, he first dribbled some powder into the pan, then put the remainder of the powder and the ball into the muzzle and rammed it all home. If the enemy was close, bayonets could be fixed. Close quarter fighting was a brutal business. At the Battle of Vimero, the bodies of a British and French soldier were found who'd bayoneted one another simultaneously. Eventually, six months after the French first saw the lines, they retreated to Spain, broken, dispirited, and above all hungry. Massena was recalled to France. The French army had lost perhaps 30,000 men during their invasion of Portugal, and Wellington just a few hundred. That was the extraordinary achievement of the lines of Torres Vedras. Back in Britain, the French retreat marked the turning point in public opinion. Everyone rejoiced. From now on, the British were behind Wellington's war. Now he had reduced the French army substantially, Wellington embarked upon a much more offensive campaign. His new aim was not just to put pressure on the French in Spain, but to drive them out of the country. Wellington was determined that no avoidable mistakes should undermine the offensive. I begin to be of the opinion that there is nothing so stupid as a gallant officer. I am obliged to be everywhere, and if absent from any operation, something goes wrong. Wellington's obsession with detail ran through every aspect of his life. He found time to send exacting instructions to his shoemaker in London on the design of his customised boots, and paid careful attention to his personal grooming. All his gentleman's necessities travelled in a beautifully fitted dressing case. There were razors, nail scissors, a toothbrush, and even a pair of these pools to heave on those famous boots. Wellington knew that prominent citizens were inconvenienced when he took over their houses and kept some spare sets to give away as thank you presents. Very Wellington, nothing flash, just the best of simple, expensive, good taste. To launch a successful invasion of Spain from Portugal, Wellington needed to capture the fortress cities of Ciudad Rodrigo and Badajoz. These fortresses guarded the two main routes into Spain, and both were held by the French. In January 1812, Wellington successfully laid siege to Ciudad Rodrigo. He then marched his troops south to Badajoz, to one of the greatest and darkest episodes in the history of the British Army. His troops surrounded the city and began digging the parallels or trenches that would house the heavy cannon needed to batter the walls. The digging was hard and the army was poorly equipped for the task. After the parallels were dug and the guns installed, the Allies started to pound selected areas of the walls, creating a breach through which the attackers could storm into the fortress. On the 6th of April 1812, Wellington gave the order that the assault would begin at 10 that night. Many thought he gave it too soon. But with the French army now threatening Ciudad Rodrigo, Wellington needed a quick result at Badajoz 